Hi, my name is Mark Balls and this is the Principia IT Lifecycle Podcast. In this edition, identities, the good, the bad and the downright ugly. There are two types of identity that interest is in the configuration management business. Those that identify configurations and those that identify individuals. Let's take a look at the two types of identity. First, identities for configurations. These two numbers both identify the paperback version of Balancing Agility and Discipline, a guide for the perplexed by Barry Beam and Richard Turner. First edition, published 2003 by Addison Wesley. The first number is the book's GTIN, or Global Trade Item Number. These are the numbers usually coded as barcodes on products. Those barcodes usually being EAN 13 barcodes, EAN standing for European Article Number. Although confusingly, these are now called IANs, or International Article Numbers, while the standard retains the EAN 13 identity. These GTIN and their corresponding EAN 13 barcodes must be unique in order that store scanners can distinguish products. Imagine if this code was somehow duplicated and assigned to a TV. How would a store scanner distinguish between a few pounds worth of book and several hundred pounds worth of TV? Not to mention the problems for taxation calculations for the store's accounting software or the problems of stock control. The ISBN is the unique international standard book number. Every book published since 1970 is assigned an ISBN. Well, some self-published books are not identified with ISBN codes, but all commercially produced books are. These numbers are assigned to not only the title, but the edition and format of the book. So, hardback format is assigned a different ISBN to the paperback, for example. Originally, the ISBN consisted of 10 digits, but that was changed in 2007 when the ISBN was enlarged to 13 digits to bring it in line with the broader product EAN barcodes we discuss in just a moment. These identities perform different functions, even though they identify the same item. It should also be noted, because it's important, that these identities both identify a configuration not an instance. They identify all books that match the criteria, not just the specific book I hold in my hand. These identities are one to many. Each identifies a specific configuration, which in turn identifies many instances. It's fair to say that this book is an instance of the configuration identified by these identities. There's no formal identity for this book. As against any other copy of the paperback version of Balancing Agility and Discipline, a Guide for the Perplex by Barry Beam and Richard Turner, first edition, published 2003 by Addison Wesley. In many application areas, we use both configuration and instance identities. When you go to buy parts for a car, for example, you provide the model and year of manufacture. This identifies the car's configuration and allows the relevant catalogue entries to be consulted. If I want a new front main beam lamp for a 2009 Ford Fiesta, I simply look up lamps under Ford Fiesta, then 2009, and listed there will be one or more matching entries. Depending where I'm looking, the catalogue may offer me suitable alternative replacements or variants. This is a process of configuration identification. The car is identified as a configuration and the lamp is identified by refining the specific configuration, but at no time is an individual identified. It doesn't identify my car or your car. If I want to identify a specific instance of a car, I can use its license plate, a unique identity assigned by the government to each vehicle permitted to drive on the roads. Law enforcement officials can use that license plate number to find out the make, model, year and even the registered owner of that specific vehicle. Even some components of the car carry unique identities. 
The engine, for example, carries an engine number unique to each engine. And each car, well, those produced after 1954 at least, carries a vehicle identification number, or VIN. That's unique to that vehicle. There are several standards for constructing a VIN, but each encodes the place of manufacture, the manufacturer, the plant, and model year. It's interesting to note that a license plate is unique, but it may be transferred between vehicles, while a VIN is both unique and remains with the vehicle throughout its life. Why then not use VIN rather than the license plate to identify a vehicle on the road? Firstly, they perform different tasks. The one shows that a vehicle is licensed for use on public roads within a certain jurisdiction, while the other is simply an identity used usually by the manufacturers to track vehicles. For example, allowing a batch recall to be controlled. Secondly, and perhaps most practically, the identity space requirements for license plates is much smaller than that for a VIN. Licenses are issued to fewer vehicles. They're issued by more local authorities. You can consider that the UK Licensing Authority issues about 34 million vehicle licenses, where there are over 1 billion vehicles operating worldwide. The VIN is 17 characters long, not exactly easy to recall, um, or record for that matter. While the UK license number is typically eight characters long and grouped, making it easier to recall. Having seen some examples of the two types of identity, we'll now look at constructing and assigning identities. When designing an identity scheme, you need to consider how these identities will be assigned. Are they going to be assigned by a central authority or by some distributed authorities? Consider a very simple identity scheme for documents. Every document is assigned an integer in a sequence from 1. So the first document is numbered 1, the second number 2, the third one number 3, and so on. This is not a particularly good scheme, but it does meet the uniqueness criteria, providing we recognise the scope of the scheme is limited to the organisation assigning the numbers. OK, now suppose we're working in a large organisation. A new document is proposed. How is this document's identity established? One method would be to apply for an identity number from a central authority. The application is made, including details about the document title, type and so on, and the central authority assigns a new number. The next one available from the identity number catalogue. An entry is made in the identity catalogue and the new identity returned to the requester. Sounds fine. But now consider that in a large organisation, thousands of such requests could be made. And if you need to go to the central authority every time, the delay in obtaining a new identity starts to grow. In the past, when these requests were handled manually, the delays could be very significant. Nowadays, online real-time requests mean that these delays are somewhat shorter. However, the potential for the central authority to be unavailable can cause its own problems. And in large organisations that operate around the clock and around the world, this sort of central authority can become a significant bottleneck. One simple solution to this issue is to allocate blocks of identities to sub-authorities. These sub-authorities can then freely allocate identities from these blocks, without the need to constantly refer back to the central authority. So, for example, if we had offices in Europe, India and the United States, the central authority might allocate blocks of 1,000 identities, 1 through 1,000 to Europe, 1,001 through 2,000 to India, and 2,001 through 3,000 to the United States, for example. When a sub-authority begins to run short of identities, they make one request to the central authority and receive a new block of 1,000 identities. This approach is essentially a subdivision of the identity space, uh, a common approach to the problem of identity assignment. 
In fact, each of the codes, ISBN, GTIN, VIN, etc., mentioned earlier, partition their identity space. Unlike our ad hoc system, these schemes use the identities themselves to encode the partitioning. Notice in particular that the GTIN code for a book is very similar to the ISBN. This is a deliberate reuse of the existing ISBN identity. The first three digits of a GTIN are the GS1 member organization code, which normally identifies where the manufacturer of this product is registered, although there are some special codes. Uh, in the case of books, the special code 978, the so-called Bookland organization code is used. After the Bookland code comes the normal ISBN group publisher and, I and title identities. The final digit is a check digit in both ISBN and the GTIN forms, so it's likely to be different because the GTIN accounts for the additional three GS1 code digits. These codes are non-trivial to decode because, for example, the group identity can vary from one to five digits. This is because the space for the publisher and title components varies considerably depending on the language being published. English, French, German, Japanese, Russian and Chinese publishers fall into groups identified by a single digit group, leaving eight digits to be divided between the publisher and the title elements. Less widely read languages, such as Zhonga, the national language of Bhutan, are published under the Bhutan group code 99936, leaving only four digits to be divided between the publisher and title elements. Each part of these identities allows for localised allocation of identities. For example, uh, once a publisher has been allocated their group and publisher codes, they can freely allocate the title part of the identity without needing to refer to any other authority. So, by having a natural partitioning encoded in the identity itself, we can spread the allocation of identities among authorities, removing the need for a central authority for every identity assignment, while maintaining the uniqueness of the identities assigned. This brings us to another identity issue. How much if any, and what type of information do we encode into our identity? We saw that the ISBN and GTIN codes include in them information about the source of products. This is in part to allow for a hierarchy of authorities to assign these numbers, but it also allows for items to be traced back to their source, at least in part. Uh, this traceability issue is even more true for things like manufacturer assigned product numbers, such as the vehicle identification number mentioned earlier, which are commonly used to identify specific production batches so that any defective product can be quickly and accurately tracked back to the specific production plant and the, the run that produced them so that the manufacturer can determine if that batch had a common fault that requires corrective action or even a recall to the batch. The practice of embedding information becomes problematic when you try to embed the wrong sort of information. What is the wrong sort of information? Well, a common mistake in identifying hardware, such as desktops, is to encode location in the identity. This seems at first sight like a good idea, after all. How convenient would it be to confirm the location of a desktop machine just by knowing its identity? Of course, the help desk would require only the asset identity to establish its location. The problem becomes obvious when your organisation has a reorganisation and the machines are relocated with the people to whom they're assigned. All of your identities are now rendered at best meaningless, at worst misleading. The bottom line with encoding information into identities is this. If there is any chance that the item's attribute you're going to encode in the identity will change over the lifetime of that item, then you should consider carefully whether to use it. It's better to keep this information in your CM database, identified by the identity rather than encoded in the identity. Consider again the GTIN and ISBN codes. 
The attributes encoded in these identities formed a useful and static hierarchy that partitioned the identity space, allowing blocks of ISBNs to be assigned independently, while still ensuring the identities remain unique. The publisher of a book will never change. If a book's content is subsequently published by a different publisher, it's considered to be a different book for the purposes of ISBN assignment. My advice is to always make sure that any information you encode into your identities is used to partition the identity space and not as a place to store that information. Your CM database is the correct place to store information about items, not their identities. So far, we've not talked about versioning. Sometimes this information is encoded directly in the base identity. An ISBN implicitly includes version information in that each edition of a book has its own ISBN and there need be no relationship between the ISBNs assigned to the two editions. More commonly, version information is provided by a second identity because version identities tend to have their own form. I'll address the version identity space in detail in future podcasts. One of the most widely used identity formats is the URI, or Uniform Resource Identity. You may know it from its subset, the URL, or Uniform Resource Location, used for addressing web pages. A URI breaks the identity space into a natural hierarchy. It also makes it easy to adapt the meaning of the parts of a URI without compromising its uniqueness. On the downside, as URLs show all too clearly, a URI does not have to uniquely identify items. In fact, it's very common for web pages to move, changing their identifying URL, without necessarily changing their content, or conversely, for a page's content to change without its corresponding URL to changing. There was an effort to address this second issue in the form of the WebDAV standard but it's not been widely adopted and URLs remain poor identities without strict management by the authority that assigns them. That said, the URI schemes themselves can create very useful identities and they are used extensively throughout IT systems for precisely that purpose. The emerging semantic web standards, for example, rely heavily on URIs for unique identities. I certainly favour the use of URIs for a number of reasons. Firstly, they're easily parsed, and there are many tools available for parsing them. They're infinitely flexible. You can use already established forms, such as the HTTP schema, or you can create completely new schemes if required. URI spaces can be mapped one to another, so it's usually fairly easy to map a specialised URI into a web address space, described by, for example, HTTP URLs. They form natural hierarchies and identity space division. Above all, they're easily addressed into computer systems. What does this mean in practice? My favourite identity scheme for document identification breaks down into four elements, each a refinement over an initially broad identity space. We can turn this into a fully globally unique URI very simply by adding a scheme and a domain, something like .colonmyorg.com. What's more, these URIs can be mapped using, for example, a web server onto a version control system like Subversion or Git, or even onto a simple directory structure to provide access to the underlying documents associated with each identity. I can, for example, define my scheme as .colon, and as part of my scheme I can allow a second scheme that identifies where the document is stored. So. If I was storing my documents in git, I would use dot colon git colon, if in subversion dot colon svn colon, all the while keeping the same scheme specific part, uh, myorg.com slash a slash b slash c slash d. You should notice that the scheme is not part of the identity, it simply informs us what form the identity is in. So doc colon git colon could be read as this is a document identity suitable for Git. 
uh, if Git and Subversion require different formats, we can still say that the two identities doc colon git colon and doc colon svn colon are the same if, according to the doc scheme rules, they are equivalent. Uh, that is, that they always identify the same document and only that document. OK, in this edition, we've covered the basics of identities. We've talked about the way that identities must uniquely identify either a configuration or an individual item. We've also discussed the idea that we can set up our identities to have a hierarchical partitioning of the overall identity space. This makes it easier for sub-authorities to assign identities without the need for centralised coordination. We've passed over the issue of versioning. Um, but we'll return to that and we'll talk about version spaces and how it differs from product design space and so on in later podcasts. For now, hopefully this has given you some idea of how to design your own identity schemes. Identity schemes that will guarantee uniqueness, but also not limit you or bottleneck your identification process. Okay, that's it for now. See you next time.